Okay, so I'm going to be presenting some of our studies um, that have looked at the psychological well-being of surrogates and also their families. The study I'll be talking about was actually a follow-up study to an earlier study of um, surrogates who were seen one year following um, the birth of the child. Um, and the study was really set up to answer the following questions. So do surrogates experience psychological problems in the longer term? So these are in the years following um, the surrogacy, are they experiencing any psychological issues? Do they stay in contact with the intended parents and the surrogacy child um, over, over the years? How do surrogates view their relationship with the um, family? Do the surrogates' own children experience psychological problems? So although we have, we have um, seen that there have been studies, well, our study mainly, of um, the children, of, uh, children who are born through surrogacy, there were also concerns about how children within uh, the surrogates' own family might be thinking about uh, and feeling about their mothers carrying um, a pregnancy and then seeing that child um, given to another couple to raise. So we really wanted to understand more about what it's like for surrogates' own children. And how do surrogates' children view their relationship to the surrogacy child? So like I mentioned, the current study was a follow-up study of 34 surrogates who were seen one year after the birth of the surrogacy child. So 10 years after this original study, we con tried to contact the surrogates again. We contacted 20 of them who agreed to take part in the study. And in order to increase the sample, we also recruited a further 14 surrogates um, through uh, surrogacy clinics sorry, through fertility clinics uh, in the UK. So in terms of the sample, most of the surrogates had children of their own. Only one didn't have any children. Most of them, 65% of them, were married um, or in a cohabiting relationship. In terms of their occupation, we can see that a third of them were in professional man managerial occupations and a third were them in skilled non-manual occupations. And in terms of the type of surrogacy that they had completed, um, around a third of them had done traditional surrogacy, so had used their own egg for the surrogacy arrangement. 41% of them had done gestational surrogacy, so they were not genetically related to the child. And then we found this further group of 24% of surrogates, eight of them, who had done both types of surrogacy, traditional and gestational. And we were actually quite surprised to see this category because previous studies had found that surrogates were either traditional surrogates or they were gestational surrogates. So we were also interested to see why was it that this sort of group was emerging where they had done both types. So why were women um, deciding to be surrogates? The, the main reason that they were giving is because they wanted to help a childless couple. Some of them also mentioned wanting to help a child, childless couple alongside enjoying being pregnant. And other reasons including wanting to help a family member or um, a friend, or seeing others struggle with infertility, or also valuing their own children and their own families and wanting others to also experience that. So one of the things that's quite unique um, to our sample is that the surrogates have done multiple surrogacy arrangements. So um, although the, the, the mean sort of surrogacy arrangements that they had done was three, um, were the range from one to eight. So we did have um, surrogates who were doing multiple surrogacies and we wanted to understand why it was that they were continuing to do further surrogacy arrangements. So what were the reasons for doing further surrogacy arrangements? And some of the reasons that they mentioned was wanting to help a family have a sibling for the child, uh, again, wanting to help a childless couple, having a previous positive experience of surrogacy and therefore wanting to repeat that positive um, experience, uh, enjoying pregnancy again, having an unfulfilled expectation from a previous surrogacy, um, and so then wanting to do a further surrogacy in order to have a more positive experience was also mentioned. Payment was mentioned by two of them. Request from a surrogacy organisation was also mentioned, and as was um, not intending to do a further surrogacy arrangement, but meeting a couple who needed surrogacy and then changing their mind about this and going forward and helping them. So uh, we assessed, um, well, we measured surrogates' levels of self-esteem and depression using standardised um, tests, and we can see that most of the surrogates fell in the average or above average range for self-esteem. And also in terms of their depression, most of them were showing no signs of depression. And remember that this is almost 10 years following um, the birth of the surrogacy child. And we also found no differences in self-esteem or depression between surrogates who had completed gestational, traditional, or both types of surrogacy. 
So do the surrogates stay in contact with the family? So as I said, um, in our sample, the surrogates had done multiple surrogacy arrangements. So of the 34 surrogates, they'd actually done 102 surrogacy arrangements between them. And they stayed in contact with 77% of the surrogacy children, 85% of the mothers, and 76% of the fathers. And in terms of how frequently they're, they're seeing, um, or at least contacting the families, we can see that for the child, at least, it's not very frequent, similarly with the father. Um, and the most frequent contact is actually maintained with the mother. We also asked the surrogates how they felt about their level of contact. Um, and what we found was that there is a range of contact that they might have with the families. So, um, and in terms of how satisfied they are, most of them actually feel that the amount of contact they ha have, and this is regardless of whether they are in contact or not, feel that, it's, that that level of contact is about right. I'm just going to point out some of the numbers here in the column to do with contact with a child. So here we can see that um, eight of them were not in any contact with the child and also felt that this wasn't enough. And that was usually when the contact had been stopped by the couple. So when there was an intention to stay in contact with the couple, but then the couple then terminated <laughs> contact, that's when they felt that the they were disappointed in that and wanted more contact. Of the 15 who weren't in any contact with the child but were actually happy with the, the level of contact, um, seven of them were actually in contact with the parents, so were getting updates about the child through the parents. Four of them never wanted contact in the first place. Two said that they will, will be in contact with the child when the child is older. One said that there was no contact due to the couple's preferences, and one said that they had agreed no contact with the couple from the outset. So I, I think what this table really highlights is that there is a range of contact preferences that surrogates have, um, and it's not the case that they always want to maintain contact with the um, families that they help or that they don't want to. And often um, their <coughs> feelings about contact might change as well. So there might be an intention not to have too much contact, but during the pregnancy they develop close relationships with the families and then therefore continue contact um, following the birth. So how do surrogates view their relationship with the child? Well, the majority of them um, re reported uh, positive relationships with the child. So, for example, this surrogate said, I think the world of her. There's nothing maternal there, but I love her to bits. She'll always be a special little girl to me. And 11% reported more neutral relationships. So, for example, I think it's like any of my friend's children. I don't get personally involved with them, even when they come to visit me. 10% reported no relationship, and 3% said that the child was too young. And what do they call each other? So, you know, these are new relationships that are being formed. So how do surrogates refer to the child born through surrogacy, and how does the child refer to them? And some of the terms that they were saying they were using included, you know, being referred to as auntie or a special auntie or a tummy mummy, um, and they may refer to the um, surrogacy born child as a niece or nephew or simply just by, by, by each other's names. So how do surrogates view their relationships with the couples? Well, the vast majority of them reported um, positive relationships with the mothers and with the fathers. An example of this included, we can just all be ourselves and we know nobody's perfect, but having been through so much with the surrogacies, you just get to see it all. And it's nice to have people around that you don't feel you need to put up any barriers. You can just be. So this kind of reflects the positive relationships that can develop um, between surrogates and the parents. Neutral or ambivalent relationships were reported with 8% of mothers and 9% of fathers. And an example of this is um, the father's fine. I don't tend to have a long conversation with him because he just doesn't. But that's not to say there's anything wrong with him. It's just he's not one for chatting, but he's perfectly OK. So it's a much more neutral kind of um, relationship being described there. Um, and in terms of no relationships were reported also with 3% of mothers and 6% of fathers. And do the findings differ between gestational and traditional surrogacy? Well, we actually found no differences between gestational and traditional surrogacy arrangements in terms of whether or not surrogates and surrogacy families stayed in contact, the frequency of contact with the child didn't differ, whether or not surrogates were happy with their level of contact didn't differ, and whether or not they viewed the relationship as being positive didn't differ uh, between gestation and traditional surrogacies. Uh, but we did find differences in terms of uh, more frequent contact with intending parents for um, gestational surrogacies, 
for gestational surrogates, sorry. And gestational surrogates are more likely to report a special bond with a child compared to traditional surrogates. At the beginning of the study, I'd also said that there was a new category that we weren't expecting of um, surrogates who had done both types of um, surrogacies. And we found that the main reasons for doing traditional and gestational surrogacies is because they were meeting a couple who they wanted to help, but that couple required a particular type of surrogacy. So, for example, they may have done traditional surrogacy previously, but they met a couple who needed gestational surrogacy, and so they switched and, and, they, and gestational surrogacy for them. So we were also interested in the experiences of the surrogate's own children. Um, so we interviewed um, the surrogate's own children if the, if the child was aged over 12. And we did that deliberately because we wanted to ask them quite detailed, in-depth questions about their mother's involvement in surrogacy. So we ended up with a sample of 36 uh, children. Of, so they weren't all children, but they were the children of surrogates. They ranged in age from 12 to 25, with a median of 17. They were aged 2 to 15 when their surrogates, um, when their mothers did their first surrogacy arrangements. And the number of surrogacy arrangements their mothers had done ranged from 1 to 8, with a median of 3. 39% um, of them were male, 61% female. And 44% of their mothers or their parents were in a marriage or cavity relationship, and 56% of them, um, their parents had been divorced or separated. And again, we can see these three types of um, categories in terms of the type of surrogacies that their mothers had completed. <coughs> so in terms of the psychological health of the surrogate's own children, we found that most of them actually scored um, either average or above average for self-esteem. And only two of them scored above the cutoff of five, which indicated a likelihood of a psychiatric um, problem on, the, on an assessment of the general health questionnaire, which assesses um, um, psychological problems um, in young adults. So how involved is a surrogate's family? The extent of family's involvement in the surrogacy process varied. So for some of them, the surrogacy was kept very separate from their family life. So, for example, she keeps it separate from us, really. It doesn't really affect us. It's just family with a bump. Um, and another said that, they, that they're, in, in their case, the whole family was involved in the surrogacy process. So um, this partner of a gestational surrogate, we did also um, speak to the surrogate's partners as well, said, we talk about it as a couple. We are a couple and we do things as a couple. And the surrogate is one of the things we do as a couple. So, again, it really varied um, between different surrogacy arrangements. Um, so like I said, we also included, um, we also interviewed some of the partners of surrogates. Um, and in terms of how they felt about surrogacy, the vast majority of those who took part in the study had positive views about surrogacy. So for example, um, this per partner said, it can make people parents who desperately want to be parents, who for no reason of their own cannot be. I can only see it in a positive light, I have to say, genuinely only in a positive light. So how do the surrogate's own children view surrogacy? Again, the vast majority of them saw their mother's involvement in surrogacy as being positive. So this child said, I think it's a brilliant thing. I think just for someone to go through what my mum went through to make someone else happy is amazing how someone would do that for someone else. So that was the, that was the majority of the kind of responses we were getting. But 14%, so five of the children, did see it. Uh, had a more sort of neutral or indifferent um, um, feeling about their mother's involvement in surrogacy. So, for example, this child of a traditional surrogate said, I don't have a problem with it. If mum wants to do it, that's her prerogative. So it's sort of feeling, a feeling of indifference. We asked the children if there were any difficult aspects of surrogacy for them. And only some of them said mentioned factors that they did find difficult. And some of the things that they were talking about was Maintaining a relationship with a surrogacy child um, was, was difficult. Um, health complications for the surrogate was mentioned by three of them. Receiving negative comments from other people. The surrogate not being able to take the child out. Um, and the baby being handed over or the seeing the surrogate upset was also mentioned, but only in, in one case for each. We also asked them what they thought the rewarding aspects of surrogacy were, and more of the um, surrogate's children um, mentioned rewarding aspects. And for them, rewarding aspects included the relationship with the child and the intending parents, 
being proud of their mum, helping another family, <laughs> seeing their mum happy, travelling and meeting people, and um, two mentioned uh, the positive effect it had had on their own family. We asked them what would have made surrogacy easier for you, and um, only a minority of them actually responded to um, this question or had something to say about it. So three of them mentioned surrogacy being less taboo or there being more awareness of surrogacy. Living closer to the intending parents would have made surrogacy easier because sometimes the ge geographical distance may meant that it was much harder for them to maintain contact if they wished to do that. Having a better relationship with the intending parents was mentioned by one, or the surrogate having an easier pregnancy was also mentioned by one. Um, so again, what are they calling each other? So um, these are the surrogate's children who are in contact with the um, child um, who has been born through surrogacy. And some of the terms that they were using included brother, sister, a sorrow sister, tummy sister, a surrogate brother, a sort of a cousin, a half brother, half sister. And one of the things we found was that there were no differences based on whether or not the surrogate had, was a traditional surrogate, so had used her egg for the pregnancy, um, and whether she was a gestational surrogate and hadn't used her egg. So they were using these terms of brother or sister or half-brother or half-sister really based on the strength of relationship that had been developed between um, their family and, and, um, and the surrogate-born child. So just to conclude um, from this study then, the surrogates did, do not experience long-term psychological problems as a result in their involvement in surrogacy. Most surrogates maintained contact with the surrogacy family, and most surrogates and surrogacy families continued to stay in, um, in, to see each other in person. The surrogates' families felt positive about the surrogates' involvement in surrogacy, and also few differences were found between surrogates who had done traditional, gestational, or both types of surrogacy. So I also want to briefly just talk about um, surrogacy in a different context, and I know we'll be hearing more about this in detail in the next talk, um, but I think it does highlight that these findings may obviously not always be re replicable to um, other contexts. So we have also done a study of Indian surrogates. We um, saw 50 surrogates from a single clinic in Mumbai. All of them were carrying for international intended parents. Um, and we compared them to 69 expectant mothers from General Hospital in Delhi and Mumbai. And this study was part of uh, a PhD project by a colleague of ours, Nishtalamba. Um, and she interviewed all the surrogates and the com comparison group during pregnancy, so four to nine months um, into the pregnancy, and also went back and interviewed them four to six months after the birth of the child. And uh, we collected data on anxiety, <coughs> depression and stress. We also assessed um, the level of bonding to the fetus during pregnancy. And here we were really looking at the levels of instrumental prenatal bonding. So this is the extent to which surrogates were showing um, care and being attentive to the fetus, and more, also emotional prenatal bonding. So this was the extent to which surrogates were interacting and also attributing characteristics to the fetus. And we were also ex interested in their experiences of surrogacy. And what that study found was that surrogates showed higher levels of depression compared to the comparison group during pregnancy and also after the birth of the child. We didn't find any differences between the two groups in terms of anxiety and stress. And surrogates showed higher levels of emotional prenatal bonding and higher and low, sorry, <coughs> showed lower levels of emotional prenatal bonding and higher, in, higher levels of instrumental bonding <coughs> compared to the expectant mothers. So they're um, bonding with the baby in different ways to women who are carrying uh, for themselves. We were also able to see whether there were any factors associated <coughs> with the pregnancy um, that might um, relate to the levels of depression. So what we found was that lower perceived support during pregnancy, hiding surrogacy from others, and also receiving criticism for being a surrogate, significantly predicted higher levels of depression after the birth of the baby. And surrogates with lower educational status and who had a positive experience in the surrogate house were more likely to emotionally bond with the fetus. So conclusions from that study were that surrogates are more likely to show high levels of depression than the comparison group of expectant mothers. But this might also be due to their circumstances prior to the surrogacy. We didn't assess their <coughs> mental health before they went into a surrogacy arrangement, and it's possible that their mental health was already poorer when they entered into the surrogacy arrangement. But of, of course, the sample was only recruited from one clinic. 
So um, these are some of the, the references that I've drawn on in this presentation, and they're all available on the resources page um, if you wanted to read about this, this, this study, but also um, the studies that Susan presented on earlier as well. 